Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on, Teresa. I've been really looking forward to this. Me too. I, I loved the book. Um, and I do want to say before we even get started that I know the book includes in the title that it's for thoughtful men, but I really think it's applicable to women too. And I think even if women are already communicating consciously, I think it gives them some insights into maybe the struggles that men are having with it for all kinds of reasons. So thank you for that. Yeah, it's really lovely to hear you say that. Thank you as well. And other women are, are saying the same thing. And it's interesting. I, it, it was my book writing mentor and she suggested that I, you know, choose a, an audience and she suggested that it might be good for men. So I followed her advice. But, you know, it's interesting because it's usually women that are picking the book up off the shelf and reading it um, and saying thank you and then giving it to the men in their life. So oh, that's great. Yeah. And I can see that. <laughs> Um, I think we should probably just start with the most basic question I have, which is what prompted you to write the book? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think communication, it, I've been coaching for quite a while and, and many thousands of hours of coaching and themes come up as we're working together as people. And one of the themes that, that continues to come up is that us humans tend to come unstuck in communication. <laughs> You know, quite often, you know, whether it's within an organization and, and two departments are wanting the same thing, it's the same higher purpose, but they come to loggerheads in the miscommunication. Or in a more intimate setting in a relationship, for example, two people who love each other, but are coming unstuck in, in the, the missing each other in communication. So that, that you know, was a theme for me. And, and I think communication, because it is such a fundamental part of our ability to exist as a species, that it gets overlooked. You know, I mean, when we think about it without communication, we wouldn't have even been able to evolve. You know, we, it was in being societal creatures and coming and working together in community that we've even be, been able to evolve as a species and that requires communication. Uh, and, and even, you know, to take an idea and then manifest that idea into reality without communication, it's not possible. You know, Einstein could have had his genius understandings of the mechanics of the universe, but if he couldn't communicate that, it would have amounted to nothing. So there was that. And then more in the, in the present moment for me, um, as someone who has a deep love for humanity, it's been sad for me to watch people who are fighting with each other and shouting at each other across these digital divides of difference, you know, they're identifying with their political or, or ideology and just shouting at each other, which is not helping us solve the bigger problems. So there's a slight sense of exacerbation, like, come on, people, <laughs> we need to get better at this, you know, so that drove me to write the book. Excellent. Well, good timing, because I've had that same exact feeling many times here in the United States especially yeah. with our political leaders. And um, I think this is, we need to give them all one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the, one of the uh, ideas that's really throughout the book is apparent duality. And I was wondering if you could share with our listeners what apparent duality means. Yeah. So the, the reason I call it apparent duality is that it's from a human perspective that we perceive duality and and perhaps from beyond the human perspective, so, so if the universe could have a perspective, all is one. You know, everything is of the same oneness, the same unified field. Mm -hmm. However, from this human perspective, we, per we perceive duality. So we see night and day, we see yin and yang, we see masculine and feminine, north and south. Um, and, and then in the, in the, um, the kind of more personal perspective of what is it to be me in this world, there is this apparent duality because apparently I'm at the center of my version of the universe. You know, I'm the common denominator in all aspects of my life, whether I'm here chatting with you now, Teresa, or when we finish this conversation and I go off to the next one, I'm the common denominator in my life. So I'm the center of my universe. However, at the same time, I'm a tiny, tiny, tiny part of a much bigger system and, and so I'm not the center of it all. I'm, I'm a part of it all. So this is the apparent duality that I talk about through the, through the book. Yeah, and it's so true. Um, I know you're in Australia, I'm in Los Angeles, and I forget that sometimes. And all I have to do is drive over to the beach 
and just sit and look at the ocean. And it always reminds me like, oh, you're just this little speck of a, of a very important hole, but yeah. just one little piece of it. Um, one of the uh, things you talk about, and I get a lot of pushback on this myself, is the importance of time alone. And I know we live in a, or I feel like I live in a culture, I, don't, I can't speak for you, but I live in a culture where people seem to want to avoid being alone. And so they don't understand why I like having time alone. So could you talk about why it's important? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is funny, isn't it? And and when you request time alone, people even get slightly offended. And they think yeah. there's something wrong with them. Like, what is there something wrong with me? Why don't you want me around kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. No, I, I love you. I, I just also love time alone. <laughs> um, I, look, I think it's fundamentally important. You know, when you think about it, our experience of existence is all happening in our mind. You know, so every piece of information that is available to us from our environment, we receive it through our senses as in bits of information. And then we represent that information in our mind. So the quality of our mind matters. And the quality of our mind really has a lot to do with our relationship with self which is our relationship with the past. And so spending time curating this, spending time alone to, to heal our attachments to the past, to smooth out the creases, I like to say, um, I think is vitally important because, you know, the, 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 the nicer, the, the more okay we are with self, with relationship with self, then the more clearly we can engage with the rest of life. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because I thought I, I did get a little tired of being alone during the pandemic, but uh, or the, it's not over, but, you know, during the lockdowns and everything. And I thought, well, maybe I won't want to be alone anymore. But it only took me about, a, I don't know, three weeks of no, I still yeah. need time alone. <laughs> so it is important because, yeah. you know, whether it's to contemplate, to meditate, to to just be still, you just can't do that the same way with other people. And I have had that same reaction from people like, what do you mean you don't want to go with me? You said you're not doing anything. It's like, well, yeah. no, I am doing something, but I need to do it alone. You know, I just need to be yeah. alone. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think this is this um, speaks into what we were talking about before with apparent duality. As much as we need each other and we need connection and we need love and we need to, you know, be in community, without the aloneness, that is only half of what it is. You know, so with the aloneness is the other side of the duality scale in that conversation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, I did like that you, you mentioned in the book that you don't like using the words right and wrong, but instead functional and dysfunctional. And so yeah. I wondered if you could talk about why that's more effective than right and wrong. Yeah, look, I think right and wrong um, suggests that um, I'm better than you. Or, or that I'm worse than you. It suggests that my moral or ethical compass is better than yours or not as good as yours. It's this comparative thing. And I think it's very easy for us to come unstuck in terms of um, you know, collectively combining, collectively connecting across culture and across difference, and then being able to harness the power of diversity which is what we need to do, you know, and the global problems that we face, the pandemics, the inequality, the global warming, these problems don't discriminate. They really don't mind where you grew up or what you look like, you know, and for us to solve these biggest problems, we need to come together. We need to be able to connect and collaborate. And if I'm judging you because I think that the way you do something is wrong, then I'm not going to be able to hear you. And then for us to together come and broaden our horizons and, and work together. So yeah, I, I, I tend to avoid the right and wrong. However, having said that, if somebody else wants to live their life with a perspective of right and wrong, that's not right or wrong by me either. You know? Yeah, I, I, it struck me just because, and again, the, the sort of discord, and I know it's not just in the United States. I know it's not everywhere like it is here, but that's part of the root of the problem to me is that everyone is so focused on them being right that there's no discussion because you can't hear the other side when it's that black and white like that. Um, yeah. and that it kind of leads into my next question related to the ego. And I think a lot of people 
have difficulty with it, you know, with managing their ego or understanding their ego, or they have the misperception, which you also uh, mentioned in the book, that the ego is the enemy, which is not the case either. We need our egos. But this is the one area where it did strike me related to men, only because men, due to their conditioning, I think over millennia, seem to have more difficulty kind of understanding their identity versus their ego. So there's so many men that are more ego driven. And again, not not in any way to criticize, but to say they've kind of been conditioned to be that way. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit and, and, and how that holds people back sometimes or can prevent them from, you know, fully reaching their potential. Yeah. Eckhart Tolle talks to this point as well in some of his books about how ego um, traditionally was much stronger in men than in women. And perhaps if we look, really look back, you know, from an anthropological point of view, that, you know, it was more of the male job to go out and hunt and gather and, and, you know, be right and be resolute and get that done. Whereas traditionally it was more of the female role to be more community mind, minded and human centric and, and have more expanded awareness, more about us rather than me. Whereas for the male, it was more about me. Um, so, you know, th there's that whole story to it as well. So, yeah, and, and that there's the lingering around of that. Yeah. And when you think about over the, the grand scheme of time, you know, our, our old brains and our old patterning have been around for so much longer than this new one period in life, which is really only in the blink of an eye. And it does get in our way, you know, because when we, our ego, um, you know, one of the traits of our ego is that it's determined to be right. It needs, it needs to be right. And when we identify, which we do, when we identify with our politic or when we identify with, with our ideology, then, you know, when we're governed by our ego, which for most of us, we are most of the time, then there's this desperation and determination to be right, which means proving others wrong. So it gets in our way, gets in the way of communication. Yeah, I, I've had, had several conversations with guests about, the empathy I have for men in that arena. And again, not to say women, do, there are lots of women that are very egocentric or, you know, have not learned yet how to get out of that mode either. But for men, and again, we're talking like over a long period of time, things have changed dramatically in what's really very recent times. And I don't think that they, they get any kind of training or information or education or, and so it's, I keep thinking, well, how many generations does it take and you do talk about this to future generations, but how long before they're not having to deal with that on top of everything else in life. So I do have great yeah. empathy for that because it's kind of wired in a little bit, not that we can't change the wiring, but I think that's a, that's a big challenge for many men to even begin to overcome. Yeah. Um, I guess on the, at the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> we'll talk mm. about the spiritual mm. aspect of communication. Mm. So um, I did find this very interesting because I do think there are a lot of people who don't realize there's a whole lot going on that we can't maybe automatically see or realize is happening. And they get stuck, I think, because they're, you know, it's what's in front of them. It's black and white. It's linear. You know, it's, it's that whole concept versus all this other stuff that's going on. And so yeah. I'm wondering, um, I guess, basically, how do you think spiritual uh, communication can help us or what is spiritual communication I guess yeah um to to simplify it in my mind because it's a very beautifully complex conversation and, and we you and I could talk for days about this um so to simplify it in my mind you know I put ego at one end of a scale and and my sense of spirituality or spirit at the other so ego is very me centric it's all about me and therefore spirit is we centric, you know, ego understands itself in being separate from its environment. So I, my ego sees me as being separate from you and notices the differences. Whereas my spirit sees us as being of the same thing that we are in this together. Um, you know, the ego is fueled by fear necessarily because it's a protection mechanism, whereas spirit is fueled by love. And so communication and, and communication, the word comes from the Latin noun communicatio, which is a sharing. 
and the Latin verb communicare, which means to make common. So if the idea of communication is to make something common, then it's a spiritual quest. It's us coming together. It's us um, resonating in love with a capital L in, in the vibration of love together. You know, and for me, that's a spiritual experience. Yeah, no, I, 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 again, agree. I think that's beautiful. Uh, in sharing the story of your brother's passing, which I'm very sorry, uh, you talk about difficult conversations, of which that has to be the toughest that I can imagine. But could you talk about why it's important to move into these conversations instead of avoiding them? And also what getting the green light means? Yeah, sure. Funny that you ask this question. Um, at the time of recording this interview, it's the anniversary of my brother's death today. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So 12 years today. Um, and and before coming online with you, I just sat for half an hour in meditation. Um, yeah, and contemplation and in honor of my brother, who I still love very, very much. Difficult conversations. Um arguably more important than the easy ones you know it's it's through the hardest aspects of life that we learn the most uh, and i believe as a part of um the universe we're here to evolve that's that's a part of why we're here i i believe anyway and we evolve through the hardship through the struggle through the pain through the suffering so avoiding those conversations is avoiding our inevitable growth you know, and connection, we connect through, we connect through grief, we connect through vulnerability, we connect through these harder aspects, you know, and for so many years, because I knew no different, like many other humans, and especially men, because we're indoctrinated culturally and stereotypically to, to not be vulnerable and not to show our weakness, quote, unquote, I kept my, my deepest, darkest, tortures and and anxieties to myself you know for most of my life and it's only been in the last decade since my midlife crisis slash awakening um, that I've been teaching myself to um, to be vulnerable to share to be open to have nothing to hide and through that I've really lived and realized that that allows much deeper and more authentic connection with other people and the number of people that come forward to me and especially men who say wow I thought I was alone you know in my suffering so I think these these uh, the challenging conversations if we speak our truth with love if we come to those tough conversations with good intent so if my intention is for the greater good of all concerned and I speak my truth with love, I, I must trust that the end result will be okay. And it might be hard for you to hear what I'm saying in this moment, but if I'm sitting there compassionately, that I, I have to believe that through the course of our communication, we will come through the other side together. Yeah, and, and you're so right because we don't learn anything, which means we're not growing when everything's going well. Because yeah. why would we, right? <laughs> don't rock the boat. Don't, you know, don't jinx it. Like, you know what, people, we don't learn. We don't grow. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with enjoying life and not having a problem, but it is, for, whether it's a mistake to a crisis, it is in those moments that we are faced with some kind of a challenge. Yeah. Even Again, even small ones sometimes, but especially the large ones. And I do think a lot of people suffer in silence because they don't know how to to enter into those difficult conversations. So I really appreciated you covering that in the book. Um, oh, and, and let's go back a little bit though, mm. or maybe for some of the lesser or maybe not as, as uh, painful, and maybe so, you tell me, what, what's the green light? What is it about the green light that helps you through this process? Yeah, so getting the green light is basically asking and giving permission to have these tougher conversations in whatever context that is. And I think that quite often those, those confrontational conversations, the ones we avoid, we avoid them because, because they're going to be confrontational because of the context. 
you know we we think oh oh uh, this person's going to react in a particular way and and i don't want to upset them and i don't want them to be angry with me or upset with me and 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 because of the context that's what's going to happen whereas if we had created a different environment where where this person welcomed us to have the courage to come and say the tricky things if we knew if we knew that that person welcomes these tough conversations from us it'll be much easier for, for us to have the conversation so getting the green light is creating an environment in the work environment it's creating a team culture where where we encourage each other to have the courage to have these conversations in a relationship you know with my beautiful partner we set up the foundations of our relationship such that it is um, okay and more than okay it's it's a, a mutual expectation we have of each other to always speak our immediate truth that that's more important to us than the, than the conversation being comfortable or not right right yeah mm. part of it when i was reading through that chapter made me laugh not because it's a funny topic but because for years i would say we need to talk and that just sent my partner into a, a frantic tizzy because he always assumed <laughs> it was going to be something terrible. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, ask if we can talk about something. And I remember finally <laughs> learning that myself, not saying we need to. Yeah, we need to talk. And he's going, oh no, what have I done yeah, now? What am I, well, yeah, what am I in trouble for? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> part of what you talk about is, um, and, and, and you say that this is important in communicating, is letting go or softening your grip. And so I was yeah. wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. You know, it relates to what we were talking about before with our ego identifying with the way we think things should be and, and being very defensive about that. And so I think it's, um, and, and, you know, it's very human for us to um, have an idea about how things are and not only to defend that idea, but to seek evidence to back up that idea. We have this thing, and you know, I'm sure you're aware of confirmation bias, psychologists call it. And we, if there's contrary information to our idea, we will avoid it, or if it's put right in front of us, we'll read it and then refute it and go back to our original idea. And then, you know, you look at social media platforms now and the algorithms have, have inadvertently created what we do naturally in life anyway, which is surround ourselves with the, the, the stuff that feeds our idea. So we end up in these little bubbles of reality, which we think it's reality, but it's just our version of reality. And so I think it's really important to loosen our grip on the way we think things should be which is a, it's a discipline because it's very natural for us. You know, you see something in a news feed and instantly you have an opinion, you know, oh, that's, that's rubbish or, oh yes, yeah, see, I knew that was right. We, we instantly have an opinion on things. And I think it's a discipline to notice our reaction and to pause and take a breath and go, oh, maybe, maybe not you know, just to have that moment to pause. And I think in, in relation to communication, this is so important because when you're listening to someone and they have an opinion, you're queuing up already in your mind to either refute it or agree with it or jump in and say your point of view. And I think it's important to pause and say, well, maybe, or, or maybe not, let me lean in and seek to understand, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I had to get out of that habit myself years ago when I first started my training and what I would do is, you know, I'd have that thought like, well, that can't be right, or that doesn't make any sense. It was a very judgmental, you know, reaction. And I just learned it automatically. Now I do it. Well, how do I know that? I just ask myself, how do I know that? And that stops yeah. that spiraling of, you know, more and more they're wrong, I'm right. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, what you said is absolutely true. It's not one reality. It's all of our different perspectives or perceptions of reality. And I think that's what we really need to learn to stop or to maybe not stop, but to lower the, lower the dial a little bit on this divisiveness, because yeah. none of us knows if we're right or wrong, if we're going to use those terms, we don't really know ever, right? Because we, yeah. we don't know what the impact's going to be five years from now, or 10 years from now, or a thousand years from now. So who's, you know, you know what I mean? Who's going to tell you for sure you're right or wrong about something? I don't yeah. know. I love that question that you ask yourself, you know, do I know that to be true? And it reminds me of, one of the questions that Byron Katie asks, I'm not sure if you're aware yes, of Byron yes. Katie. Yeah. And what a, what a beautiful, wise individual. And, you know, one of the questions that she asks or she encourages us to ask ourselves when we have a belief or a thought around something, 
do you know that to be true? Can you, can you prove that that's true? You know, and it's, yeah, it's a really lovely contemplation moment, isn't it? It is. And I, I did come across her work later and actually followed her sort of more formal, the work, you know, to really deepen or anchor that lesson. But I was so grateful. I don't even know who originally, I don't even know if somebody told me it was just, I started realizing like how, well, I started with, uh, I was studying ego and it's like, well, who do I think I am? That's what that's how it really started. And that sounded yeah. very negative. <laughs> so I kind of like, oh, well, how do I know that? <laughs> who do you think you are? <laughs> yeah, who, do you, who, do I, who do I think I am? <laughs> I was raised in Texas. You know, so it was this whole thing about, you know, not getting too big for your britches or who do you think you are? Right. And that's what popped into my head originally. So that's funny. Oh, I love it. That's really cute. Um, you have a chapter on mindful communication, which is of course pertinent to our audience. Um, Can you share some insights or tips into how people can practice both integrated and dedicated mindfulness that will improve their communication skills? Yeah, absolutely. So integrated mindfulness, um, as your listeners probably know, it quite simply is just integrating the, the practice of coming into the present moment and noticing what you can notice while you're doing something that you ordinarily would be doing listening. Uh, you know, ordinarily be doing. So you can integrate mindfulness into brushing your teeth. You can integrate mindfulness into sipping a glass of water. You know, anything that you do, you can do mindfully. And so listening mindfully is, it's such a gift. You know, not only do you, are you better positioned to understand the person you're listening to, but but the the, the two-way symbiotic um artistry that can occur is really quite beautiful because the person speaking is very attuned to whether you're actually listening or not and and how present you are and the more present you are the more they relax and the more eloquent they become and I've watched this transformation I've had people who I coach say to me oh I'm not a very good communicator Gem and I I can't speak very well and within minutes of me giving them all of me in the listening they relax and they and they're super beautifully eloquent and they're like oh wow and I say you have no problem with communicating at all but that comes in the listening you know so this is a beautiful gift being able to listen mindfully and then a dedicated practice of mindfulness um, as you know is training our ability to to keep coming focused you know so we're very distracted us humans we get distracted very easily with our busy thinking thoughts brains Um, and so the ability to come back into the moment and to keep focusing is wonderful for communication you know and and this for me mindfulness meditation is the opportunity to release myself from identification and the identification is our ego which is the part that's desperate to be right and to justify and judge and but so the more time I spend releasing myself from identification and just noticing then the less I feel like I have to defend in a conversation I don't feel like I've got anything to defend I'm kind of more curious in in understanding you and and seeing where the conversation goes if that makes sense yeah absolutely it does and I appreciate that because there are still a lot of people who dismiss mindfulness because they don't have time. So no matter how many times I say it, or, you know, I read it or whatever, it's in their head. So thank you for confirming that, because that's, that's really one of the best ways to build your mindfulness skills is to just build it into those daily routine habits that you have. But at the same time, and this speaks back to even alone time, although you can meditate with a group, but you do need that more, um, the dedicated part to strengthen your focus, which, and, and it becomes symbiotic to me with Uh, Someone asked me once, I can't remember now exactly how the question was, but it was something along the lines of, well, how long do I have to meditate before I can feel a difference? Right. And of course, it just depends on you. But uh, even when people ask me, well, how long did it take you? Because I used to be a very, very left-brained, analytical, linear thinker, corporate person. And I can't remember how long it took because it wasn't like there was a, a bell that went off. It was all of a sudden I realized I wasn't as tense at work. I wasn't as reactionary, but it's a slow process that were gradual process. I should say not simply slow, I guess, but there's no magic answer, except if you just do these little things, like pay attention to what you're doing when you do them and set aside at least a little bit of time for that more contemplative, you know, uh, alone time to, so that you can really tap into that. I, I think of it as tapping into that, the bigger source, you know, the, the, the expanse of whatever you believe in, but something bigger than yourself. 
and it becomes a habit. Both of them become a habit. And then you, you just notice there's a difference is the best way I can describe it. Yeah, but that's the, you've described it really well. That's, that's the way it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't believe how fast time went today. Okay. Well, I guess my last question to you will be, why should we pause often? Oh, I love my pause moments. I really love them so much. It was, um, why should we pause often? I was about to go and tell you the story about where that came from for me, but maybe we don't have time. Oh no, so go I'll right just... ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, so I was, when I was at the Global Mindful Leader Forum in Sydney, Australia in 2014, one of the keynote speakers who was a meditation teacher from America came onto the stage and it was just the right time for me to hear what he said. You know, timing is so important. And I'd heard this message probably a dozen times before, but the timing wasn't right. And there were two things that he said that really stuck with me. One was know the work. He was talking about meditation, but do the work. And that really resonated with me because as a coach, I was suggesting meditation to my clients, but I didn't have a dedicated practice. I had a kind of sporadic here and there, sit down, do a bit of a meditation practice. But it was in 2014 that I decided I need to make this habitual and it needs to be daily. So that was that. But then the second thing he said was that landed for me was pause often. That's all he said, pause often. And I thought, wow, that's, that's resonating with me. How can I turn this into a habitual practice? So I created these moments that I call pause moments. They're only three to five seconds long. It's just pausing what you're doing. And that doesn't mean picking up your phone and scrolling social media. It means pause, take a breath or three, and just notice what you can notice just for a few seconds and then continue. What's happened over time um, with these pause moments, not only have they become habitual for me, but they have become these little micro recalibration moments where I very literally within a few seconds come back to my place of equanimity many times throughout the day. It's wonderful. You know, I personally um, don't enjoy being late for anything. And so if I'm running late for something, which invariably these days is on a laptop, if I'm running late for a meeting, just before I open the laptop, I'll pause, take a breath, notice what I can notice and continue. So I'm only three seconds later to the meeting than I was going to be anyway, but I'm showing up now in a different state of yeah. being. And so these little micro recalibrations, this is one of the little one percenters that I suggest to anyone who's, who's open to hearing tips. It's a one percenter that over time makes a massive difference because we, we get very, very good at being the driver of our own physiological bus. So I, I could be in a heightened state, whether it's frustration or anger or disappointment or sadness or whatever it is, a heightened vibrational state. And I can bring myself back to calm really easily, but that's over years and years and years of pause moments and meditation, obviously, as well. So yeah, I love pause moments. They, they keep it simple, three to five seconds, just breathe, notice what you can notice and continue. Yeah, I, that resonated for me. Well, do the work resonated for me too, because that is, you know, the, com the common theme for, because, you know, I do workshops and, and facilitations and coaching and all of that. And it's that you read a book or you go to a workshop and you think it's fantastic. And then you go home and you don't do the work. And so that's like the running theme with me lately is how can we encourage people to really do the work? But you're right. Part of it is timing. If you're not ready, you're not ready. You know, you'll get yeah. there when you get there. But yeah. the pauses I also practice, I, I didn't, didn't think of it as, you know, I didn't have a little phrase for it, like pause often, but I am, even the minute I feel either I feel tension coming or I recognize I'm doing something like I let out not a sigh of relief, but like a semi growl or I slam a door a little too hard or something. <laughs> I have all these reminders. Oh, you need to take a pause. And again, it, it's, you know, maybe 10 seconds breathing and I'm yeah. right back on track. And so I do yeah. think it's extremely powerful and it doesn't take any time. So it's a twofer. Yeah. And for people who are wondering, how can I create this as a habit? Because I forget, keep it simple link the habit to an existing habit. James Clear talks about this in his book, Atomic Habits, which has done wonderfully well over the last few years. But I, I had kind of been thinking, I can't remember where I first heard about this many, many years ago, just link the habit to an existing habit. So you brush your teeth twice a day, stick a little 
sticky note on the mirror next to your toothbrush that says pause. You know, so every time you reach for your toothbrush, you go, oh, pause. <sighs> right. And then what happens is we create a neural association. So over time, you don't need the sticky note next to your toothbrush. Every time you reach for it, you remember, oh, pause. So you can put it. I had sticky notes all around my house years ago. Too. I had a coffee machine in the kettle and the car and every keys and everywhere. Pause, 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 pause. And then over time, like the habits that we create, you don't need the sticky notes anymore. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I also encourage people to set a little alarm on their uh, smartphone since they want to yep. use the device, use it for something good. Just set a little yeah. alarm. Even if it's once an hour, if it's for five seconds, it's not taking any time out of your day. So yeah. and I do have to say the reminders are so important when you're first starting because it is, it's too easy to get distracted. And so I also had sticky notes all over the place. Um, people would come in my house and it was like, what is wrong with her? Because they were inside the <laughs> cabinet doors on the visor of my car. So if somebody's in the car, I put the visor down. There was a little note. Um, I just needed yeah. constant reminders at first. And it does. It becomes natural after a while. You don't need it anymore. So yeah, that's so true. Easy to make those changes. I, I learned it first from Charles Duhigg. Um, uh -huh. And it's same concept that James Clear, uh, I mean, yeah, James Clear picks up on. But yeah. it's, uh, it, they're not hard is the point. There's it's easy to do. You just have to dedicate the intention of doing it and it'll come. Yeah, that's right. And I think if you create for yourself a strong enough reason why, why do I want to have the self-discipline to create this habitual practice, you know, and you've got to associate it to something that's really meaningful to you. You know, if you're a parent, use your kids on yourself as leverage. Look at those little people that you absolutely adore and would do anything for and say to yourself, do I want to be a better version of me for them? Do I want to be the best parent I can be for them? Do I want to be more calm, more present, more centered for them? Oh, yes, I do. I really, really, really do. Great. Use that as leverage on yourself. Right. I'm going to put sticky notes everywhere now. Why? Because I want to be the best parent I can be for those two beautiful, innocent human beings that I'm responsible for. You know, yeah. that's using, creating your own leverage, you know? And, and the beauty of that is you're also teaching them at a young age to follow those same habits, which will, yeah. I don't know, help them avoid some of the pitfalls most of us have all gone through. So that's, yeah, that's beautiful right. advice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today and sharing all this wisdom. And I, it's really been a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, you too, Teresa. Thank you so much for having me on. And and accommodating the time difference for me. It's really lovely. And can I just quickly say, thank you so much for actually reading my book. Um, you're the first person who's done that, the first podcast host who has read my book and then and been so respectful as to reference it all the way through our conversation. And I feel very loved. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for writing it. You're Take welcome. Take care. Yep. Mm -hmm.